Alexander Brown was a linen merchant who emigrated to Baltimore from Ireland in 1800, becoming very successful. He was a major stockholder in the Second National Bank of the United States, along with Gerard and Astor, and his sons would go on to found one of the largest merchant banks in America. Brown Brothers had a London branch as well, Brown Shipley and Company. The Browns have always had close ties to the Bank of England. In fact, it is an unwritten rule that the bank's Board of Governors must always include a Brown Shipley director. One of them, Lord Montague Norman, served as Governor of the Bank of England longer than anyone in history. If you guessed that the Browns enjoyed close ties to the Rothschilds, you would be correct. In fact, it was through George Peabody's connections with the Brown family that he was first welcomed into the Rothschild circle. Undoubtedly, the Rothschilds' closest allies were two German banking families, the Schiffs and the Warburgs. The Warburg family name is legendary in banking. M. M. Warburg & Company, based in Hamburg, is the oldest bank in the world and remains in private hands. The Schiff family shared a house with the Rothschilds in Frankfurt, the very house that Nathan and his brothers grew up in. Jacob Schiff first came to America after the Civil War and in 1875 went to work for Kuhn Loeb and Company. He promptly married co-founder Solomon Loeb's daughter Therese and took over the bank. Paul Warburg, who was regarded as the architect of the Federal Reserve System, followed in Jacob Schiff's footsteps, first marrying Solomon Loeb's other daughter Nina and then joining Kuhn and Loeb when he too came to America in 1902. Warburg was chairman of his own bank, the Bank of Manhattan, and sat on the boards of many important companies, often together with Schiff. Before Warburg came to join him in New York, though, Jacob Schiff spotted two promising entrepreneurs and lent them his support. One would become the undisputed king of oil, the other, America's preeminent railroad baron, John D. Rockefeller and Edward H. Harriman. Rockefeller was pious, hardworking, and ruthless. He and his brother William formed Standard Oil together, and by buying out or forcing out competitors, the company at one time controlled 90% of the refining business in the U.S. Harriman was no slouch either. He would eventually control the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the Illinois Central, and a few other lines, as well as the Wells Fargo Express. He also sat on the board of National City Bank of New York, along with Schiff. Jacob Schiff arranged the financing for both the Harriman and Rockefeller empires, either through Kuhn and Loeb or National City Bank of Cleveland. The Rockefellers dabbled in banking too. William Rockefeller and his son Percy were both directors at National City Bank of New York, and William's grandson James would one day be chairman. The bank best known as a Rockefeller bank, though, was Chase, which was built up by John D. Rockefeller's son. Eventually, Chase would merge with Paul Warburg's bank to become Chase Manhattan, after which J.D. Rockefeller's grandson David would become chairman there. Oddly, these two New York banks were considered rivals, despite the fact that they were run largely by the same family. If the Rockefellers had a rival, it would have been Morgan. J.P. Morgan pioneered the merger. He financed Thomas Edison's company and merged it with another electric company to form General Electric. He bought Andrew Carnegie's Steel Corporation and combined it with others to create U.S. Steel. In the early 1900s, Morgan and his companies controlled a billion dollars in assets, an incredible sum at the time. Which is why there was universal surprise when it was discovered upon Morgan's death that the worth of his estate was only around seventy million dollars. A lot of money in those days, but nothing like what he was believed to be worth. The truth is, he was playing with someone else's money half the time. Morgan, like the rest of these players, was one brick in a financial pyramid, the top tier of which was occupied by the Rothschilds. With the addition of a few other bit players, this pyramid is a pretty good representation of the cartel that would form the Federal Reserve in 1913. But first, there would be a war. The similarities between the Spanish-American War and the war in Iraq are uncanny. Both happened around the turn of the century. Both were preceded by a well-coordinated propaganda campaign. Both were won quickly, but were followed by a long and painful occupation period. The U.S. was bogged down for years in the Philippines fighting insurgents. The death tolls of both invading U.S. troops and local civilians are eerily similar. Finally, both wars were based on a lie and initially supported by an American public which had been duped. While the robber barons were consolidating their control over American industry, several politicians, a Navy admiral, a newspaper man, and a lawyer were beating the war drum, pushing the U.S. toward war with Spain, which still held possessions in the Caribbean. 
you might think of them as the neoconservatives of a hundred years ago. A couple of these men are worth taking a quick look at. The leader of this group was Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt helped drum up support for war with fiery speeches, while he and Elihu Root led a campaign to modernize the U.S. Navy. Root was Secretary of War at the time under McKinley, and Roosevelt became Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. If you were wondering if these men were connected in any way to the bankers and tycoons we've been talking about, Elihu Root was their lawyer. He personally handled the legal affairs of J.P. Morgan, E.H. Harriman, and other powerful men, constantly running back and forth between Washington and New York. The Spanish were no saints, and an independence movement had sprung up in Cuba. The rebellion became more belligerent with U.S. backing, and Spain responded by throwing Cubans into relocation camps. William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper mogul, ran stories vilifying the Spanish and their abuses. Reportedly, an artist he had sent to Cuba to record the alleged crisis wired back, saying there was nothing to draw. Hearst famously replied, You provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. In 1898, the USS Maine was sent to Cuba to keep an eye on things. Three weeks later, an explosion sent the Maine, along with 260 American sailors, to the bottom of Havana Harbor. Spain was blamed and the U.S. declared war. Spain's wooden ships were no match for the newly modernized U.S. Navy, and the war was over within months. The U.S. took possession of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Cuba was given limited independence, but the U.S. kept Guantanamo Bay for itself. As it turned out, Spain had nothing to do with the sinking of the Maine. It's unclear if the explosion was a simple onboard accident or if the ship was intentionally sunk to get the war started. Either way, with its victory over the Spanish, America entered the new century as a world power. President McKinley was re-elected in 1900 with Teddy Roosevelt as his running mate. McKinley, who had resisted going to war, was barely into his second term six months when he was assassinated. Teddy Roosevelt assumed the presidency.